Just wait a second. Hey, what's up, everybody? Andre Fluellen, former eight-year NFL defensive tackle. I'm here on the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast with Kayla Bradham. You're going to enjoy this one. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast. So excited today to have Andre Fluellen with us. Andre, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. I am super excited. Thank you. So I'm going to get right into this, Andre, because we have a lot to cover in 30 minutes. How did you get started in football as a little boy? How old were you when you started playing and what made you want to go pro? All right. So check this out. This is a funny story. All right. So growing up, all growing up, I did not like playing sports at all. All right. So I like to do two things playing fat kid growing up like seriously I was a big kid right so I like to do two things I like to eat pizza play video games no sports was involved in that at all so I started playing football in high school my brother made me play football because he used to see that I was this big kid but I was always running just as fast as some of the other smaller kids like just playing pick up and peewee or whatever and so after school one day it was football tryouts and I was on my way home, put on my book bag and everything. I was on my way home, about to go on the school, school bus. My brother grabs me and turns me around. And I said, I'm going home. My brother said, it's football trials today. I was like, yeah, man, I'm not playing that sport called football. Man, my brother, he's an older brother, right? And, and I was bigger than him at the time. But you ever, you know, if you, had, it's, I, you do it to your kids. But you ever look at them in the eye, you give them that look, like that look right there. He gave me that look and immediately I just knew that I had no choice but to play football. And that is how I got my football start. If it wasn't for my big brother, I would have never played football. That's a great story. It reminds me of Gilbert Brown. Same story. Same story. I love it. And then getting into college, did you get a full ride? Were you offered a, a scholarship? I did. So I went to Florida State University. Um, and the reason why I went to Florida State, why I chose Florida State is, uh, you know, even though I didn't really enjoy playing football that much in high school, there was one thing I was not going to do. I was not going to go out there and get my butt kicked, right? Like more than anything, like it's one thing to not really love the sport, but it's another thing to not love it and just get your butt kicked. So I used to practice and play really, really hard for not so much. Man. My, uh, one of my friends, so I, I, was, I told one of my friends, I said, hey, man, I really want to go to Florida State. And he looked at me and he laughed at me. And he said, nobody from Cartersville, Georgia, ever goes to Florida State or will ever go to Florida State. You need to get that out of your head right now. That's never going to happen. And from that moment on, I said, oh, I'm going to Florida State. That was my sophomore year. And so that's how, uh, you know, so I ended up getting a full scholarship, uh, played under coach Bobby Bowden, who to me was one of the best coaches of all time. And I uh, just enjoyed a, an amazing, amazing time down in Tallahassee, Florida. That's awesome. So obviously you did well in school, well enough that the NFL had an interest in you. How did that turn out? All right. So, you know, going through college, uh, I would say I never thought I was going to play in the NFL, believe it or not, which is funny. I never, I just never had that inkling. I, I, you know, I was a journalism and film minor. Right. And so, uh, so I always wanted to be a broadcaster. That was like, I wanted to be a news anchor. That was my goal. I never had aspirations of playing football, but again, I used to go out there just, I used to work so hard cause I hated losing and I hated being embarrassed. And when we get to the end, I'm going to talk about embarrassing embarrassment as fuel. So we'll get, you know, I never forget my coaches called me my, after my red shirt junior year, my high school coaches, they called me freaking out, going crazy. And I'm like, yo, what's going on? They said, look, look at this website. And so they sent me this website link and they said, look, man, look where they have you getting drafted next year. And they had me, Andre Fluellen, the fat kid from Cartersville, Georgia, who didn't like playing football as like had a, had a first round grade. And I could not even believe it because it was never on my mind to play football, to play in the NFL. So you know, so going through that and then just, you know, playing and again and getting drafted. I mean, it was just like, I couldn't believe it was me more than anything. Like, and the reason I went so hard is because there were other people who really like, I guess their whole life was about playing football and they never made it. And so I always thought about them every time I worked out, every time I played, I thought about them because they would love to be in a position that I'm in. So that was, that was it really. Yeah, count your blessings, right? Count yeah, your blessings. So eight-year NFL veteran, 
And your favorite team, I know the answer, but tell the audience your favorite team. Favorite team is definitely that blue and silver wave with the Detroit Lions. Love the Lions. Bills, though. I really like playing with the Bills, but the Lions, uh, yeah, definitely my squad. All right, and I'm just going to flip the camera so everybody who's watching this can see me. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, Pat, go. <laughs> so wrong. <laughs> so you play in the NFL, and you're obviously an amazing veteran, just one, one of the most amazing players in the NFL, in my opinion, working hard, playing hard, great teammate and after eight years it's time to be done right and how did you know what to do next all right so that's a really good question and that's a it's a loaded question i'll try to unpack it uh, as best as i can so you know during my entire career even though i you know i had a, had a good career played eight years but still i mean i got cut 10 times over the course of my career all right so you know six times with the lion like seven times with the lions one time with the bills uh one time with the dolphin one time with the no, eight times with, with the lions all right so i got cut brought back cut brought back cut brought back so played along up and downs in my career but i love my career right it really taught me a lot um how to handle adversity and all that and so with that see a lot of athletes and even myself it's hard to have a plan b when you are so hyper fo focused on plan A, okay? And so what I mean by that is if I take, you know, football is a high performance sport, right? I have to be on the top of my game at all times. And so if I, some people can take a little bit of a mental awareness all can't, okay? So what happens is there's like this weird, uh, it's this weird balance. Right. Do I go hyper focus on plan A? Right. Or do I take a little bit off of plan A and put it into plan B? And so, but what happens if I put it too much into plan B, my plan A suffers and I'm I'm done in the NFL. And so it's a really, really weird way of thinking about things. So the way that I transitioned successfully was honestly, I had a plan B, right? Because I got into financial planning and things like that that career right i only got into it because i thought i could make some money doing it but like i hated the fact that wealth management and trying to get my other friends to invest with me when i was an english major in college right like that didn't really work out and so but that was my plan b because i only thought of it from the financial standpoint and so what i really think that most people and so after i did that you know I, that didn't really work out i did that for two years and I, you know, then I got into the broadcasting and speaking and things like that. And so the reason why I transitioned into doing was really based upon some of the things that didn't work out. And I had to learn from that. Like I had to go through what I didn't like in order to really find what I did like. So that's how I became successful in my post career was just going through stuff that I just hated doing, but it made me realize the stuff that I love doing. So that's, that's a long answer for that question. It's an it's okay that it's a long answer for the question, but let's tell the audience, and by the way, let's remind them, this is the Legacy After the Locker Room podcast, uh, powered by Stables Media with today's guest from the NFL, Andre Fluellen. Andre, what was it or what is it that you do love doing? Uh, all right, so a, a couple things. I love, absolutely love connecting people. I love connecting people and I love connect, connecting people who have something that the other person doesn't have. Okay. Like too often we think of networking in a sense of two people who are similar coming together. And then you need somebody who's almost an opposite of you. And so what I love doing, and I found out. So when I was in the wealth management side of things, I used to talk to all these super, super smart, you know, numbers people. And I didn't really know. Know, know everything that they were saying, but I knew that they were saying things that I needed. Even though I didn't like the business, I still knew they, they were saying things that I needed. So I said, okay, let me think about this. If I can connect athletes, right, who have real world sense, but in terms of business sense, not so much because we've been playing sports for so long. If I can connect these athletes, business executives who have been in business for 20 years, 
right? Like, so if I've been in sports for 20 years and this person has been in business for 20 years, like we can combine this influence with this experience and you can create something that's like amazingly awesome. And so that's what I love doing. I love connecting the dots of like, okay, this person doesn't have this, but this person has this. So we're going to connect these two people together. I, I like, I get so much joy out of doing that. Yeah. And, and clearly you do because you started the beyond the game network and I love the tagline. Um, I've been using your tagline to describe you to some of my network and that's turning pro athletes into athletic professionals, right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about the network, Andre. Okay, so I'll tell you about Beyond the Game Network. So we're a group of about roughly 30 or so uh, former professional athletes, current and former professional athletes across all sports, right? So we have male and female athletes, baseball, track and field. We have an extreme snowboarder as part of our group. And so what we do is we have those athletes business executives all right so here's how beyond the game network works and and this is what i love so we are an investment group all right our group does make investments and we are a kind of a syndicate group so people will come and invest alongside with us but we don't allow our athletes to invest in startup businesses or we invest in startups because the re reason we realize this is athletes you don't really need to invest your income but you can invest your influence all right. So I always say this all the time. Influence is greater than income any day of the week. So what we do is and, you know, any of our business executive members, uh, they, they say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. We use our business leaders that are part of our group and they write the check to, checks to startup founders. OK, so they'll actually fund it using their income because they've made it and they've made it over the course of their careers. And then at the same time, the athletes will use their influence. And I say that right in an in influence check to the to the startup founders and so now everybody wins because now athlete can get a little bit of equity without having to having to put out any income business leader gets an, an, an additional investment and that risk is mitigated because now he has influence pouring to that startup founder as well. i think that's uh it's like this three-part flywheel yeah it's a three-part flywheel that really works together where everybody wins and that's what I, that's what i'm always looking for. so that's what beyond the game is you know we do other things in media and we have media shows but more than that more than anything we are uh, a really an investment group but we use influence over income so andre that's um it reminds me of john pointer who was a guest a couple of weeks ago played in 87 during the strike for the packers and he heads up the women and minority funding aspect of the Small Business Administration. When you're working with these pro athletes, are you doing anything uh, extra or above the mark to really help women and minorities? Absolutely. Oh, so, so glad. So glad you said that. So glad. All right. So look, so of our investments, so I'll talk about the kind of the startup founders first and we'll get to the athletes. So with our startup founders, hey, eight of our, we've made 13 investments in different, you know, sports media technology companies. Eight of the 13 investments, no, sorry, nine of the 13 made have had either a minority or female on their founding member team. All right. Like, so in the terms of in venture capital world, like that, the, the odds of that, or the, you know, that ratio is like astronomically high because for the most part, venture capital VC back money 85 to 90 percent of it goes to Caucasian males all right that's just that's just how it goes and so you know and the thing is here's what we do though and here's what we teach the athletes all right we don't invest in these companies that have you know that have women and minority uh, founding because we invest in these companies because they're the best all right and so what happens a lot of times when we tell our athletes this like it's not always about being minority only or minority more like minority like you know it's not just about that but at the end of the day you want to do good you want to make sure that they're the best in that respective field because if you're just giving somebody a check just because of what they look like you're kind of doing the same thing everybody else is doing all right and so we we get everybody out of that no business this is still an investment so what you do is if there's two that look alike, all things are equal, then you can make the decision like, hey, I'm gonna support a minority founder. 